opportunity that you have given us once again to come into your house, Lord. And, and my prayer is, Lord, that as we've got so many things in, that, that's going on both today and in the upcoming week, Lord, those things are going to happen and they will sort of take care of themselves. They were, they're going to come no matter what. And so our concern about them, our worry about them is not going to change that in any way, shape, or form. And so I pray, Lord, that at least for this very short amount of time that we have here this morning, that you would clear those distractions from our hearts, you would clear them from our mind, so that we could focus completely on what you have for us. Lord, our goal here this morning is to not know about you, but to know you. The only way we can know you is through your Spirit who gives us the sermon to be able to read your Word and understand who you are and what you have done for us. And there are those who are carrying burdens here this morning. So many of us carrying burdens of so many different kinds that we need to hear a reminder of your Word when you tell us to take our burdens and place them on you because you can handle them, Lord. I gladly do that here this morning. Place them on you, that you would be willing to carry our burdens for us. It's something I can't even begin to fathom. But I thank you. That is your desire is to carry our burdens. Your desire to lead us through difficult situations. To guide us, even through the midst of pain and suffering, to be able to see you for who you really are. And so I pray that your spirit have free reign in this place here this morning, that it will, he will embed himself in every heart and every mind, and that every heart and every mind will be open to the word that you have for us here this morning as you have called us, if we have come to faith in you, if we have received your free gift of salvation, been redeemed, saved, that you have indeed then called us, Lord, to work for you, to serve in your kingdom. To serve where we are. That you have gifted each and every one of your children with the gifts and the abilities to do what you have called us to do for the furtherance of your kingdom here on this planet. And I pray that we are able to see that and understand that here this morning. Take every distraction from our heart and every distraction from our mind. And may we be completely focused on you, for it's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We are finishing up kind of an unusual series. We don't normally do things like this here. We usually pick a book of the Bible and go through. But as we began the new year and, and as, as we were directing Harmony into 2020, I did want to do a series of messages that kind of have, uh, exemplify or illustrate the four guiding principles of the church and we are here on number four and I hope you've seen kind of progression in these that we want to be a church that help, helps people discover who the true God is and as a result of that we will then worship the true God that we will grow in God and lastly that we will serve in the way he has called us to serve because he has called each and every one of his children to serve him in some way, shape, or form. Here's the bad news. I can't tell you what that looks like for you. The good news is that God will reveal that through us as we continue on and study his word and grow in him. I hope this is not bad news to you. But it's something we really need to understand before we move on to this because there is this, this idea of service and this idea of doing good works. There's always that tension among the believers between grace and good work. And how does that work? But I think if we start out on the right foot, we have a little better understanding of how God works in all of this. And I think starting out on the right foot is by understanding this statement. God does not need us. He doesn't need us for anything. If he were to need me for something, that would make him not sovereign. Because a sovereign being doesn't need anything or anybody. So that may kind of be bad news, that God doesn't need us. If that's bad news for you, let me give you the good news. He does want us. He desires for us to do his work. Think about that for a second. The God of the universe, when we come to faith in Him, 
We become a believer, saved, born again, redeemed. Again, whatever terminology you are most comfortable with, when we become a child of His, His desire is to use us in order to further His kingdom. He doesn't have to do that. He chooses to do that. He even chooses to to do that when we try to talk Him out of it. Right? You remember when Moses was called by God? He used every excuse in the book before he finally got to the one he really wanted to get to, and that is just pick somebody else. And God didn't get frustrated with him and say, no, okay, well, if you don't want it, fine, I'll go give it to this guy over here. He had chosen Moses for that moment as he chooses chooses all of us to serve in some way, shape, or form. Now, if you're like me, you probably feel the same way about that that John the Baptist did when Jesus came to him to be baptized. I'm not worthy to do anything for you, God. You are the God of the universe. I'm not worthy to do anything for you, to serve you in any way, shape, or form. When we get to that point, that's actually very good news. That's a great starting point. We do need to understand that there's nothing we can do for him, but that he chooses to use us anyway. It's really extraordinary, isn't it? With all of our foibles, with all of our issues, with all of our problems, with all of our shortcomings, with our capacity to mess up almost anything we get our hands on, God chooses us to serve Him. It's amazing that we can even make that statement out loud. The God of the universe chooses us. What does that look like? Well, that's what we're going to look at here and see what service implies here in this particular passage. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, if you want to go ahead and go there. This is not a complete picture of service, but I hope you'll see it's at least representative. And we also need to make something clear before we go through here, because Paul gives a list of gifts, for lack of a better word, or different avenues of service. And he says, to those who do this, do it this way. To those who do that, do it this way. To those who do the other thing. That's not to imply that we don't all have all of these things that we're going to be talking about here. That is, that is true. You're going to see these are some basic things, basic aspects of service that every believer has. It's just that some are given, I don't know if the, what the right term, an extra measure of that thing in order to, be, to do what God has called them to do. Does that make sense? So you're going to see as we go through these that it's not supposed to be, well, one person does that one and one person does this one and nobody else is supposed to do these other things. That's not the case. Hopefully that will become a little more clear to us as we go through. But I want us to be able to take a look in this passage of what serving actually is. And we are in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, and I will read into uh, verse 8. For by the grace given to me, this is of course Paul writing, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individual members of one another." having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, in our serving, the one who teaches, in teaching, the one who exhorts, in his exhortation, the one who contributes, in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And I hope you see, as we go through that list, that we are all supposed to do all of these things. But that doesn't mean that we don't have certain strengths in certain areas that other people don't. Does that make sense? So obviously, so let's say I feel as if God has given me the gift of prophecy and the gift of leadership. I don't then have to look and say, great, now I don't have to care about anybody. Because he didn't give me the gift of caring. That's not the one he gave me, so I don't have to care about anybody. I'll just do my gifts. Do you remember when Paul was writing and he said, do the work of an evangelist? You remember that passage? Paul is chiding us to do the work of an evangelist. He didn't say in that passage that everybody has the gift of evangelism. He's telling everybody to do the work of an evangelist. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to do the work of all of these. But there are some of these, which is why he points them out individually. There are some of us who are giving extra measures of this stuff in order to be able to do what God has called us to do. Does that make sense? So if we know that God has called us to be a teacher... That doesn't mean we have to ignore all the rest of the stuff because somebody else will pick up that slack over there. 
No, we're supposed to do all of these things. But there are a few in here that God gives to us in order to do a specific thing. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that this is not a one person has this one thing and nobody else has the rest of it. But these are all things that we are supposed to engage in. So let's go through them here quickly as we move on here this morning. And we're going to take a look at what serving actually means in conjunction with this passage. And the first thing it means is that it flows from God. In verse 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to each with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has assigned. Isn't it interesting that when he starts talking about gifts, and you're going to see the first two of them are really interesting, the first two things he says, the very first thing he gives us is what? A warning. He starts out by warning us before he ever gets to the gifts. Why do you think he starts out by warning us about the understanding of these gifts? Because he knows our nature, and he knows our nature is to think way more highly of ourselves than we should when it's not our gift in the first place. So he starts out by talking about grace. This comes from God. This gift you have comes from God. It's used by God. It glorifies God. Any success or any lack of success that comes along with it, all according to God. Because if we use our gifts, whatever they happen to be, if we use our gifts and we start getting recognition for it, that can be some pretty heady stuff, right? You know, I sat in the office of a pastor one time, somebody that I know and love and respect was a long time ago. He was a pastor of a church and it was growing very well and, and we were having a very honest conversation probably a little more honest than i had hoped that we would had at that particular point and he looked me dead in the eye and he said the reason people so many people are coming to this church is because of me he actually said that that was really weird to begin with and wrong in the second step we weren't coming there because of him Nobody goes, if, if they are, it's, it, obviously it's not going to stand, it's not going to last. We have to understand that when he gives us these gifts, if we experience some level of, for lack of a better word, success with them, it all belongs to him. We are merely the tools that God uses in order to be able to accomplish his will. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 Paul writes something extraordinary. I know we do 2, 8, and 9 a lot, and we kind of end up there because you'll see as we uh, read through this that those passages are very familiar. But I think we do our dis ourselves a disservice if we don't continue on and read uh, in verse 10. But here's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which you're going to find very familiar. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one should boast. And that's generally where we stop. But let's move on to the next sentence. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Isn't that interesting? The passage actually says that we are born again in Christ. If we are a believer, we are created in Christ, born again, saved, redeemed, for the strict purpose of good works. And the sentence doesn't end there. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So even the good works that we do are prepared by God before we're ever even born. We are just the tools. There's this, many of you know, I'm a, I'm a huge Simpsons fan. There's this really ridiculous episode. Of course, that could be all of them. But there's this really ridiculous episode where don't ask me how this happened because it's not important. But Homer ends up going up in the space shuttle. Okay, now when he's up in the space shuttle, obviously being Homer, he does something to damage the ship, to the hatch. And they know that when they come back in because the hatch is damaged, that they're going to burn up on reentry. And so the other astronauts get mad and they're, they're, they're attacking Homer. And Homer grabs this bar, this rod, this carbon rod, and he rears back to hit him with it. And when he does, the rod gets stuck in the door and actually pulls it too. And he ends up saving everybody. So when they crash land and they're there and the, the press is all around them and they said, how did this happen? One of the astronauts stood up and said, it was Homer. Homer's the one who did it. He's figured out. You, all you had to do was put this bar in the door and he saved our lives. All he did was put that rod in there. And then a little over the top, but the point well made, the press all of a sudden became interested in 
the rod. They wanted a picture of the rod. The rod was on the cover of Time magazine. They did a ticker tape parade with a big car with the rod sitting in the back of it. We are the rod, right? It, they completely ignored Homer. He was the one who did it. But it, was, it's like, it would be like if we built a house and we'd say, boy, wasn't that a great hammer that built that house? We don't do that. We are the hammer. We are the tool that he uses. We have to understand that it is all on him. He created us for good works. And by the way, those good works that he created us for, he ordained before he ever even created us. Just extraordinary. So he begins with a warning. Not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought and that all of this flows from God. The second one is also has an implied warning in there that people will serve in different ways. In verses 4 through 5, <coughs> For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 20 through 26, Paul gives us, a, um, a little better understanding of that. Uh, here we go. It's actually chapter 12, verses 20 through 26. Uh, he, he writes, As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater honor modesty which our more presentable parts do not require but god has so composed the body god composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it that there be no, may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another if one member suffers all suffer together if one member is honored all are honored together and rejoice we do not have the same gifts at the same time we all do different things and that's good and not one is more important or better than the other if one part of the body suffers then all of them suffer in the grand scheme of importance in the body i would think being a lower lip would not rank really all that high i'm getting here by the way i'm getting to something i really wouldn't i don't think when you're signing up you'd say hey put me down for a lower lip I will tell you something, and maybe you guys have never suffered with this. When I was a teenager, I used to get mouth ulcers really bad. You guys ever get those things? The single most painful thing I've ever had happen to me in my life was have these little tiny sores that always ended up in the same place in my body. You want to know where? The bottom lip. My entire body didn't work right because of that one little spot on my bottom lip. Guess what I thought about that whole time? I thought about my bottom lip. The thing I wouldn't normally think about on any other given day. When one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. When one is honored, we are all honored. He says, I'm writing this to you so there will be no divisions among you. He's telling us the reason why he's writing it. Because he knows there's going to be divisions among us. There are going to be some of us who are going to think that my role is better than somebody else's role. And that is not the case. We all have different jobs at different times, with different gifts, under different circumstances. But number three, serving also means that there are some roles that are a little more higher profile than others. Having gifts that differ according to the grace in verse 6, given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith. And this prophecy that's mentioned here is is, is, uh, is forthtelling, not foretelling. It basically means uh, jobs that have to do with, like with what I'm doing, being a pastor. It's something that's, that's up front. There are some jobs that have higher visibility and higher recognition, not higher importance, higher worth, or higher value. It's not the way that works, even though sometimes it looks that way, which is why we do not need to seek out after jobs strictly because they are of higher value or higher... Uh, higher uh, uh, focus, higher visibility, but neither should we run away from them for that very same reason. I'll be honest with you. I was very guilty of that early in my life. I wasn't saved until I was 20 years old. When I became a believer, for some strange reason to me then, God was constantly putting me in positions where I was up in front of people and where I was leading in different things, and I didn't want any part of that. 
None. I am an extreme. Most of you probably don't know this. Some of you do. I am an extremely introverted person. Very quiet. I'm very reserved. I don't know if I would use the word shy, but in some situations it can certainly be considered that. I know it doesn't seem like that up here, but that's a whole different thing. So that was the last thing that I wanted to do. I made the mistake in the opposite direction. I ran away from what God was calling me to do because it was a, it was a higher profile position. I didn't want any part of that. Yes, there are some that are higher profile, but those are not the ones that are indispensable. I remember in our last church that we were at before we got here to <clears throat> Central Florida, I think I may have mentioned you to you this guy before. Uh, his name is Hugh, and, and I, I will tell you, every single time I went to that church, Hugh was there doing something. Every single time. I cannot remember one time where I went to that church, that building, and Hugh wasn't there cutting the grass or tinkering with the air or painting this or cleaning that or setting that other thing up. That church, when you looked at that church, you would, of course, recognize the pastor who was up there preaching every Sunday. You would recognize the elders who had a leadership role. And you would recognize the praise and worship team because they were up there. And that church would not have functioned if you had not been there. And nobody knew who he was. I mean, they knew him. They had no idea he was doing what he was doing. He had that gift that was not a higher profile gift, but was nevertheless immensely important. We have to be able to look at whatever God has gifted us with as being ultimately extremely important for the local body of believers, which is what we're trying to do. That's what all of this is about, is how do we here at Harmony Community Church, how do we help people get to serve? There is that tension, is there not, between believers? Ah, saved by grace and I'm working, but what, how do the works figure out with grace? We don't work for our salvation, right? I hope we're very clear on that. We don't work to earn our salvation because we can't. We do work, however, from our salvation. We also don't work so that God loves us more. If I do more good works, then God's going to think more highly of me. That's not the way that works. We work, we serve, because it is in our supernatural now, our supernatural instinct to do so. We don't, our bodies don't, don't wake up every day and our thumb says, well, I guess I need to go be part of the body. The thumb already knows it's part of the body. We don't have to say as believers, I need to go find a way to be a part of the body. You are a part of the body. The only question is, are you, how are you functioning in that role? That's the big thing. How are we functioning? Am I doing what God has called me to do, what he has gifted me to do, and that he's gifted other people not to do? There are Almost, I bet you every single person, I know every single person in this room can do stuff here related to ministry, related to church better than I can do it. He has gifted you with things that he has not gifted me with. That's on purpose. That's the way it's supposed to be. So we never should look at those high profile jobs as, as better or, or, uh, or more value. They are just more seen. So service means sometimes there are higher profile roles. Serving also means, well, it just means, <laughs> it just means service. It's an excellent, interesting word here. If service in our serving, when I first read that, I thought, I've got to see what this word means in the original language. Is it that all-encompassing? It just says service. There's, I mean, all the other ones are pretty specific, right? Leading, teaching, prophecy. This one just says serving. So I'm thinking, well, I mean, we're missing something in the translation here. And we are a little bit. When you go back to the original language, the word that's used here for service is the same exact word that is used for deacon. Even though that's not what they're talking about here. They're not saying serving as a role of, as a deacon. That's not what this passage is about. This passage is just general serving. In fact, the word doesn't exist in Koine Greek. It's root word. It kind of goes back to ancient Greek. So they had to, to do some figuring out and trying to find out where exactly this word came from. And when they discovered it, the word in its original connotation, the way it was originally used that this word comes from, means to work or to struggle in dirt and dust. Isn't that interesting? So it means, in our vernacular, it means going out and getting your hands dirty, doing the hard work. Is exactly what this means. And what does that encompass? You name it. 
Whatever an act of service is to the body is what that word covers. We have folks here that we would not be able to do what we were doing if they were not here every single Sunday morning setting up and tearing down. We need more people to set up and tear down. We need more people who will serve with the kids. We need more people who will do all of these things that are just service. And they seem like they're such background roles, aren't they? They seem like it's almost like if, if, if I didn't get it, if all I did was walk in here 10 minutes before the service started, I guess I would think maybe a gnome snuck in and set all this stuff up. I, hey, it just magically got put up all by itself. But I come here early enough to be able to see everybody putting all of this stuff together. We can all do this. There are some who are more called to do that. There are some who have an extra measure of this in them. Hugh, I keep bringing him up, was one of those guys. He was born to serve. He was born to get his hands dirty. That's what he wanted to do. It's what God had led him to do. And he was indispensable, just like our folks here are indispensable. And at Harmony, I really want us to be able to incorporate more and more folks into this general service idea so that we can do what God has called us to do and to be what he's called us to be. Number five, serving means teaching. And sometimes that means in a formal way. A lot of times it means informal. In verse seven, if service in our serving and the one who teaches in his teaching, I will tell you, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I can say this unequivocally without a moment's hesitation, that there are folks in this congregation who are called to be teachers. You are called. Now, the informal way that we teach, that all of us teach is, we teach others about God when they ask us about it. We teach our children about God. So the teaching part of it is a part of all of what we're supposed to do. Everybody in here who's a believer is supposed to engage in teaching in one way, shape, or form. But in a more formal setting, being called to teach Sunday school, a small group, whatever the case may be, discipleship classes, uh, I really don't want to be the only one here teaching because I'm robbing somebody else of an opportunity that they have been called to do. You will feel, feel ill-prepared to do that because I felt ill-prepared to do that. I still feel ill-prepared to do that every single time I come in here. But it's what I was called to do. It's what God has gifted me to do is to be able to teach, to glorify Him. I want Harmony to be a place where we can identify and call and train and deploy the teachers that we need to have in here. And like I said, you're going to feel like you shouldn't be there. You're going to feel like you can't teach because you don't know enough or you're not smart enough or you haven't had the training or any of those other things. You know, most of you know this, probably just about all of you know this. I was in the Navy for 20 years, a Navy chaplain. One of the things that used to be a kind of a regular occurrence for us, and, and I know this is not going to be a shock to any of you, but, the, you know, the military likes to move you a lot. I don't know if you know that, but every now and then they kind of like just pick you up and move you to different parts around the country, around the world. We had our share of that of course, as well. And then every single time we moved, we had to go through the same process every single time. And the first, one of the first things we had to do, find a church. Find a local church. You know, we just left a great church. We're coming into an area. Now we got to find a new church. So you start, you know the rule, right? You start, you start visiting around. And if you find one that you like, then you'll try Sunday school, right? So you know, we go, now we like this church. Let's try the Sunday school class that we would be assigned to. And every single time I would go to a Sunday school class, I would do my very best not to tell the teacher what I did for a living. All I would say was, I'm in the Navy. And I would really hope they would leave it at that. Because I didn't want to have a further conversation. You may be knowing where I'm going with this. We were in this one particular Sunday school class, and the person just would not let it go. And of course, I wasn't going to be misleading to them. Well, yeah, but what do you do in the Navy? Oh, I do all sorts of things. Just, you know, here and there and... Yeah, but what do you actually do in the Navy? Well, I'm a chaplain. And then immediately, and this is the teacher of the Sunday school class, immediately it's, I don't need to be teaching this class. You need to be teaching this class. I don't know as much of you. You've had all this training. You've had all this. Uh, and I could see the person getting visibly nervous because I was sitting in the crowd and they were teaching the class 
Did they have as much formal education as I did of that? No. Did they know more about the Bible than I did? Well, it's a possibility, sure. Yeah, they could have. But it didn't matter whether they did or didn't. That's not the point. And I could see it was becoming a problem for this person. So I kind of pulled them aside. And I had to remind this person what we all need reminding of from time to time. And that's just how sovereign God actually is. And so I told this person, if God had wanted me to teach this class, I would be teaching this class. God does not want me to teach this class. He wants you to do it. Which means I have something to learn from you. Because if it was the other way around, I promise you, he would make me teach this class. I would be the one sitting here and we'd be having the reverse conversation right now. When God calls us to do these things, he will equip us to do them. Even if the people sitting in that, you know the most nervous I ever got in my entire life in preaching. Now, I'm always nervous about getting it right. That's the thing that worries me the most. Am I, am I right about this? Am I right according to God's word? Am I teaching the accuracy that it, with, with the accuracy that I need to? That's always first and foremost. The most nervous that I ever got, went back to my home church. This was years after we had left Columbia, South Carolina. I'd gone back for a visit, been asked to come back and preach at my home church. Got up there to the pulpit and looked out in the congregation and had no idea that an old seminary professor of mine was sitting right in that congregation. And I told him, you know, and I recognized him. I said, yeah, I kind of get the feeling you're going to grade me here on, the, on this. But that was the wrong way to think about that. If God had wanted somebody who was eminently more knowledgeable about this stuff than me up there, guess what? He would have been up there. That's why Jesus called regular, average, ordinary people who didn't have a ton of book knowledge, who were just hardworking, in many cases, blue-collar working people and placed them in positions over the authorities at the time. God will call you to teach. He will give you the ability to do it, and that is what serving is all about. Serving also means caring. I hate to list these as far as importance is concerned, but I would tell you out of all of these, I, I would probably put this one up at the top of the list. In verse 8, it just says, and I don't know what your version says, it says the one who exhorts in his exhortation. Um, There's an interesting word here I'm going to get to here in just a second, but this word in many different uh, versions has been translated in a variety of different ways. It has been translated exhort, it has been translated encourage, it has been translated to give counsel, it has been translated to give comfort. All of these things are all pretty similar as you can see, but the word that is used here in the original language is a word, and I don't normally give you the Greek word because it probably is not going to mean that much to you, but this one might. This, this one, when I say it, may actually sound a little familiar to you, but the word here to exhort, to encourage, to give counsel, to give comfort is a word called parakleo. Does anybody, does that name sound familiar? Is there anything about that? Have you ever heard the term paraclete in Christianity? Paraclete is the name that's given to, anybody who know, anybody know, going once, going twice? Paraclete is the name that's given to the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? In John, when he says, Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going away, but I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to send you the comforter. It's the same root word here. So the same root word used for the Holy Spirit is the same one that's used for us when we give comfort and encouragement and caring to somebody else. The way the Spirit gives comfort to us is how we are supposed to give comfort to other people. This is an extraordinary, extraordinary word. And it is one of the most important ones that we could possibly understand. Now, are we all supposed to care for other people? Yes, as believers, yes. Are there some people who just seem to have that thing about them that separates them from other people in caring, that remembers things that other people might not remember that sometimes are said in passing? 
that asks people how this is going on in their lives. Since she's not in here now, I can brag on her here a little bit. My wife is the queen of this. I'm really bad at it. I just be full disclosure at it. I'm really bad at it. I'm really bad at remembering these things. I'm really bad at catching on to these things that mean so much to people. I do it, but I don't do it nearly as well as she does. We will be talking to somebody, and she'll say, hey, you know, the last time we were talking, and you told me your cousin's aunt's niece's second and third cousin removed by blood on your mother's side was having gallbladder surgery. How did that turn out? I'm thinking, by the way, I'm only slightly exaggerating. And I look at her when she does that with absolute amazement. Because when that person hears that you remember that and you thought enough to ask about them, it changes everything. My missiology professor, when I was at Southwestern, um, lived in, in Buffalo, New York for a time. I've never been up there. I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure I could really pick it out on a map. But my understanding is it gets a little cold up there. Right? They have a few flakes of snow every year, I think, in Buffalo. Well, anyway, he said when he lived up there that it was a necessity to have a snowblower, which I've never even seen one. So he said you had to have that or you couldn't get out of your driveway, you couldn't keep your sidewalk clean or any of that kind of stuff. He had a neighbor that he had gotten to know across the street who kind of, not meanly, but kind of in a snide way, would kind of mock his faith. I can't believe you believe that stuff. He was always, always in the realm of a joke, but it was pretty clear that this neighbor didn't think much of my professor and his faith. And so my professor, when he would go out during the wintertime, and this neighbor would travel all the time, he was a business person that traveled, who's gone a bunch, he would come out and he would, he would do his little, uh, he would do the snowblower out on his driveway and his sidewalk, and he'd look across the street, and he'd see his neighbor's house didn't have all that stuff because he was gone, so he would go over there and, and then snowblow his neighbor's driveway and, and sidewalk out front. The neighbor never said anything, <laughs> never said thank you, never even acknowledged it in any way, shape, or form. And one day in the middle of the night, he gets a knock on the door. He opens the door. It's his neighbor from across the street, and his whole world had collapsed. His wife had left him. Everything was going wrong. And who did he come to? Of all the people he could have possibly come to, the guy who was cleaning off his driveway and his sidewalk because he understood that this guy actually cared about him. That caring, that encouragement. is extraordinary and can only come from him. And it has a supernatural foundation. God uses us comfort and care for others. How cool is that? Number seven, serving means giving. We've talked about that a little bit earlier when I was doing the introduction here in, in, uh, earlier in the service. Um, and, and again, this is something we're all supposed to be doing. We're all supposed to be giving. But there are some people that God has uh, moved in their heart and in their lives in order to be able to be extremely generous in their giving, that their gift actually is giving. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, I quoted it earlier, but I want to make sure that we read it. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That, that's it. That is, the, that is the grace-filled New Testament understanding of giving is that we give what we have decided in our heart based on not doing it under compulsion and doing it out of gratefulness and doing it with a cheerful heart. I want the people at HCC to give, and I want them to give in the way that they're supposed to give, not in the way that somebody might come up and use this passage from the Old Testament and say, well, um, according to this, cat pa uh, this passage here, if you don't give this much, then you're wrong or you're robbing God. You know virtually every giving passage, every giving sermon on the face of the planet seems to emanate from Malachi chapter 3. If you do not give a tenth of what you are supposed to give, then you are robbing God. You know that passage, right? I'm sure you've heard it many, many times. I, you know, I, I'm going to spill the beans on this one. I'm sure I've got a lot of my brothers out there that are standing in pulpits all across the country would not be very happy with me telling you that. That's not what that passage means, and that's not what it's saying. It is taken completely out of context. Yet that's the one we will use instead of the one I just gave you. All of the years 
that I have been sitting in churches, hearing sermons, listening to them on the radio, reading them, I have only heard one pastor preach on giving from the pulpit from that 2 Corinthians passage. Every other one has preached from Malachi chapter 3. Errantly, by the way. I don't care how much you give because it's none of my business. I do care that you give because that's a part of what we are supposed to do. How much under what circumstances? Completely between you and God. I hope you guys will understand that and see that. I believe that when you teach God's truth about giving, then people will be more generous. I really honestly believe that. You know how many pastors out there would say, I am absolutely insane for talking to you like this. Absolutely insane. You tell them they don't have to give 10%, they're never going to give 10%. You know what? I got more trust in God's word than that. I really do. My job is to tell you the truth. What you do with that truth is between you and God. Some of us have the gift of extraordinary generosity in our giving, and we need to exercise that, as we all need to exercise our service and giving in the first place. Number eight, the passage tells us that serving means leading. The one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal. I believe the New Testament teaches there are basically only two positions inside of a church that are actual leadership positions. Pastor, staff, any kind of you know, stuff like that, any of the, the ministers on the staff, for lack of a better word, and elders. That's it. Does that mean that the rest of us aren't supposed to exhibit leadership? And No, of course not. But these are more high profile, as we talked about before. These are more higher profile areas of service. But I can tell you, a lot of people look at filling those positions of leadership as coming to the conclusion of that old adage that goes, no good deed goes unpunished. People don't like doing it. Everybody likes sausage, the old saying goes. But nobody likes to see how it's made. And that's sort of, I'm going to be honest with you, that's sort of what it's like being in a leader, true leadership position in a church. Unfortunately, you have to deal with the business part of it. You have to deal with the unfortunate parts of it. You have to deal with all of those things. But God has gifted people to be able to do that, which is why we take very seriously who we bring in as elders and who we bring in as staff people here at Harmony Community Church. But ultimately, I want Harmony to be a place where everybody understands the leadership that God has granted them in certain situations. He's given you the ability to lead in some way, shape, or form. I want this church to be a place where we can discover that, where we can see that and use that to God's glory. And I'm all, I tell you, I'm very wary about people who want those roles, Right? People who are really knocking down the door to get into one of these positions, that makes me a little nervous. You guys ever see the movie Gladiator? There's this great scene where Marcus Aurelius, the emperor, is wanting to turn all of his power over to the, the, uh, the, the Roman general, uh, Maximus. And the first thing he says after he says, don't you accept this great honor I give you? Maximus says, with all my heart, no. He didn't want any part of it, even though he was being given the mantle as the leader of the greatest empire that the world knew at that time. And he said no. And then Marcus Aurelius looks at him and he says, don't you understand that's why it has to be you? Sometimes we are kind of dragged kicking and screaming. I was dragged kicking and screaming into that role. I wanted no part of it. I didn't think I was going to be good at it. I didn't think I had anything like that in me. And the fact of the matter is, I was right about both of those things. But because God had called me to those spots, He then empowered me to be able to do what He has called me to do. I hope that's what we'll see in all of this. All of these things that we are called to do are all associated with Him and His Holy Spirit to do what He has called us to do. And lastly, again, one of the most important ones we can use here is... To be, serving means to be merciful. And it's an amazing word. It's an extraordinary word in the original language. I will give you the definition of that word as it relates to the original word. To show mercy, to show compassion, to extend help for the consequences of sin. Which means we are supposed to show mercy in the midst of those who have committed some sin. That's what mercy is all about anyway, right? It's not getting 
what we deserve. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something we do deserve. And we are all supposed to show mercy to one another, but there are those of us who are even more gifted at showing mercy to people. In Matthew chapter 8, there's kind of a blink and you miss it moment, even in the midst of a, of a great miracle. I wanna, but I want us to read it here real quick. In Matthew chapter 8, I'm going to begin in verse 1, when he, meaning Jesus, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. If you look at verse 8 here in Romans chapter 12, the one who, who does acts of mercy to do them with cheerfulness. When you go back and look at that that uh, interaction that Jesus had with the leper there, the blink and you miss it moment is that there were probably a million different ways Jesus could have healed that person. In fact, he healed people in a variety of ways when he walked on this planet, did he not? Sometimes he just spoke and people were healed. One time he healed a blind guy by making mud in the ground. You remember that one? And rubbed it on his eyes. In this particular case, the scripture says, he did what to the leper? He reached out and he touched him. Leprosy was and is today extremely highly contagious. Jesus did not have to touch this man in order to heal him, did he? He didn't. He could have spoke. He could have blinked his eye. One time he healed somebody who wasn't in the same geographical location. They didn't find out he got healed until the person got home. There were any number of ways that he could have shown mercy to this leper. And when you look in that time period, leprosy was not only the worst physical thing that could happen to you, it was the worst cultural thing that could happen to you, and it was the worst spiritual thing that could happen to you. If you got afflicted with leprosy, so the thinking went during that time, if you got afflicted with leprosy, you were the worst of the worst as far as sinners were concerned because God would never do something that horrible unless that person deserved it. Now we know, of course, that's not true, but that's the way they viewed it at the time. That's why for a lot of reasons, they had to be separated. They were considered unclean, not just unclean physically, they were unclean spiritually. They were not just outcasts because they had this dreaded disease. They were outcasts because they were horrific sinners. They had to be doing some really icky things in the mind of people in order to be able to have leprosy at that particular time. Let me ask you something. In our world today, are there some icky sins out there? Are there a lot of icky sins out there we'd rather have nothing to do with? Jesus reached out and touched the leper. To show us that when we show acts of mercy to somebody, it doesn't matter how icky the sin is, we still need to show them mercy. Why? Because we need mercy. We need the very same thing. We may think our sin's not nearly as icky as that other person, but in the God, guise of God, it all looks the same. It's all just as icky. Serve means show mercy. Because these all come from God, all of these, we all have aspects of them, as I said before. He does give, as I've said also before, an extra measure to those whom he has called to lead in those circumstances. I will tell you something, and I will not, it, I will not embarrass this person. But we have, in this congregation, we have a person who absolutely oozes encouragement. That's in a good way, by the way. Usually you use the word ooze as a bad thing associated with that, right? This person oozes encouragement. This person is one of the most encouraging human beings I've ever met in my life. They have no idea that the things they say to me after and before this service, they have no idea how much it ministers to me. Now, have I been encouraged by others in this congregation? Absolutely. This one person, one person absolutely oozes it. And if I were to say the name out loud, that person would never guess in a million years that I would be getting ready to say their name. That's how that works. 
when we serve God, it's not because we wake up every morning and say, well, you know, that God, he kind of, you know, he saved me, his son died on a cross for me, rose again, I guess I better go out and start doing some works for him. That's not the way this works. It is a natural, or in other words, supernatural, emanating of his work through us. We have the desire to do it, even if we have no idea where it comes from. You've heard me mention the passage of the sheep and the goats many times. The sheep and the goats had one thing in common. They didn't realize what they were doing. Lord, when did we see you like this? Was the question they both asked. Why did they say that? Because the sheep weren't doing sheep things to get to be sheep. They did them because they were already sheep. And the goats didn't do goat things to get to be goats. They were doing them because they were goats. What was coming natural to them. Once we become a redeemed child of God, what comes natural to us is to want to serve Him. In whatever way, he calls us to do that. I hope we can see that. There is no sideline in Christianity. It doesn't exist. An old college football coach years ago was asked to define football. You know what his answer was? Football is where 50,000 people who desperately need exercise watch 22 people who desperately need rest. And I thought, what a great way to describe football. Oddly enough, it kind of sounds like the church. But we have a lot of people who desperately need to get involved or watching the fewer who are desperately need some rest. If we're all doing what God has called us to do, then we don't have to worry about that. I want us to be a church that serves. We want to serve the living God. We want to serve each other. We want to serve here in this local body of believers in order for Harmony to be the church that it can be. I, I, I... I'm not smart enough, good enough, ingenious enough to do all that. I can't do that. There are things that you are gifted at doing that I can't do because I have not been gifted at that level to do it. I so pray that Harmony will be a church that will help people identify that and grow them. And then the idea of sending them out to do what God has called us to do. God does not need us. He wants us. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have had to look at your word, Lord. I, I, I thank you that, Lord, I thank you that you don't need us. I thank you that you want us, that you desire us. That you have gifted all of us with all of these things we read, but you've gifted all of us with actually certain aspects of some more than others. And when that happens, we are to be able to identify that and then, Lord, serve in the way that you have called us to serve. And as we shift over into this time of communion, Lord, I pray that we will be able to see that, that that will be a part of this entire process, that we will be able to come to your table celebrating your death, burial, and resurrection because because of your death, burial, and resurrection, you then fill us with your spirit in order to serve you until that time where we draw our last breath on this planet and then you say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. And it will all be because you work through us. Until that time, Lord, you have put us on this planet to do something. I pray that you would lead us and guide us as a church, individually, to find out what that is, to be a part of it in order that we might serve the living God in the only way that we can, by being obedient to you. I thank you for everything you have done for us, everything you are doing for us, and everything you will do for us. For it's in the precious name of Jesus, I pray.